Are you saying that in the same way that you would stymie and end big farmers ability to influence through corporate capitalism, you would introduce measures, policies and legislation that would end the uh, ongoing power of the military industrial complex? And, and if you will permit me, sir, how would you apply that mentality to the current conflict between Ukraine and Russia and its ongoing rolling funding? Well, I think the Ukraine-Russia conflict is a direct consequence of corruption in our own government. There's a lot of corruption in Ukraine where they're siphoning off our money to enrich a lot of people over there. But it's actually it's easy to point at the finger at somebody else's corruption. It's a lot harder to take a long, hard look in the mirror as a nation and identify that corruption at home. So big tech government collusion, done. Big pharma government collusion, done. Military, private, industrial military with government done that's that's the short answer we need we have an anti-competitive arena i think that anybody who has worked in the government should have a 10-year hiatus at minimum to work in an industry that they've been responsible for contracting with or regulating that's just basic table stakes i mean the lobbying is really where a lot of this begins and, and i have a lot more solutions beyond this i personally believe that if i as the next u.s president can't work for the taxpayer and collect a paycheck from them for more than eight years, which I think is a good thing, then neither should pretty much any of those federal bureaucrats reporting into me either. Somebody shouldn't be able to work for the federal government for more than eight years continuously. That's when the corruption and the rot and the entitlement and the ossification of bureaucracy begins. And so if we can continue, I could give you a, a list of policy prescriptions, shutting down agencies, legal authority to do it. I've done this elsewhere. But this is not incremental reform. This is revolution when it comes to that deep state. Now, as it relates to Ukraine, we now see just one of the symptoms of how this corruption manifests itself. One symptom is the fentanyl crisis across this country. One symptom is hiding from the public the truth about the origin of COVID-19, the truth about what's known about myocarditis risks from the vaccine, the truth about how vaccine mandates came to be, the truth about special liability protection. Now we're just moving to another symptom of that corruption, right? Another symptom is suppressing a story right on the eve of a presidential election by big tech that changed the outcome of the election. Another symptom is systematically lying to the public about what we know about UFOs, which they now call UAPs, which is the polite way you're supposed to say it. What they've said about the Jeffrey Epstein client list, the truth about the Nashville shooter manifesto. The list just goes on. But yes, one example of this is what's really going on behind the U.S. government's support of Ukraine. So if... I told you this is a, a, a ridiculous set of facts, but it's not a set of facts. It's just actual history. And then I give you one additional fact that makes it all make sense. What I'm about to tell you probably would be uncouth, maybe intolerable on YouTube as well. The establishment Republicans are furious at me for even intimating this the other day in a speech in Iowa, but I'm just going to lay out some facts, okay? The USSR does not exist anymore. That's fact number one. Sometimes people need to be reminded of that. It fell back in 1990. Now, NATO was created to deter the USSR and to contain the USSR. NATO has expanded far more after the fall of the USSR than it ever did during the existence of the USSR. Yes, we have a 1994 Budapest memorandum that said in order for nuclear, nuclear disarmament in Ukraine, the US and the UK along with Russia will help protect their boundaries to a certain extent, and we have more than lived out the commitments of the Budapest Memorandum, but we also had a 1990 commitment that James Baker made to Gorbachev, which said that we would expand NATO not one inch, that was the exact language he used, not one inch past East Germany. So against this backdrop, we now have a, a little bit of a conflict in Ukraine, where this is following Angela Merkel, saying that the Minsk agreement was really just a matter of biding time. We've been arming Ukraine to the teeth for years under Republican and Democrat administrations alike. Putin asked for a hard commitment that NATO would not admit Ukraine. We didn't give it to them. And then Putin invades. And this is after Victoria Nuland and others in the U.S. have openly been caught admitting that we meddled with elections, talking about election interference in the 2014 situation in Ukraine, the Euromaidan protests and everything else. Against that backdrop, yes, we have a, comp a struggle with a really complicated history where Russia has made the decision to invade Russian speaking and Russian heritage oriented parts, separatist parts of Ukraine. The US has no national interest here. There's no national interest at issue. 
We have an invasion across our own southern border, and I don't use that word lightly. There are literally armed cartel gunmen crossing, invading our own southern border, and yet we're doing nothing there, sending hundreds of billions of dollars in aid in military equipment to protect this random invasion across somebody else's border in a disputed territory in the first place. Why? This doesn't make sense. A lot of U.S. taxpayers don't know this. U.S. taxpayer dollars literally today are being used to pay the paychecks of not just the U.S. deep state, but the Ukrainian deep state. Literally, the Ukrainian government bureaucrats, their payroll is being processed by money that U.S. taxpayers are sending to Ukraine. Why? Answer the question. Nobody has given me a good answer, has given the American people, more importantly, a good answer on what national interest we're advancing by using hundreds of billions of dollars of our money to pay and protect the random d disputed border of this random Eastern European nation. That's not some model of democracy. He's banned 11 opposition parties. He's consolidated state media. You know, he's got issues of his own targeting the church in his own targeting, persecuting religious minorities in his own country. So why? Now I tell you against the backdrop of that otherwise inexplicable set of facts that that same country, a state affiliated company in that country paid multi-million dollar bribes to the son of that U.S. president, Joe Biden, that's sending over that aid. Just process that for a second. Under any other circumstances, even just imagine this was Donald Trump, the same thing, except in, in substitute Donald Trump for Joe Biden and Ivanka Trump for Hunter Biden. There is no doubt that everybody in the world, including in the U.S. media and the British media along with it, would be drawing that link, that this is a repayment for that bribe. But today, if I'm saying that in a speech in Iowa, it's beyond the pale, and MSNBC can trot out Chris Christie to pretend to be bipartisan, uh, you know, guy who comes out every four years like a bear from hibernation to, you know, growl and, and complain about, you know, whatever he, MSNBC tells him to complain about, to talk about me, they won't have me on air. But it is exactly, and that's just in the last week, an example of how the establishment recoiled at my saying so. This is the most parsimonious explanation of what's actually happening. It's Occam's razor. Use the most parsimonious explanation you can to otherwise explain an inexplicable set of facts. That is absolutely what's going on. And yet we have a neocon establishment in both parties. Sometimes in this Republican primary, I feel like I might as well be running against Joe Biden and Liz Cheney because the rest of the field, even though as much as they'll pay lip service to criticizing Joe Biden's really just saying the same thing, that's really what's going on. And it is just another symptom, Russell, of that deeper corruption. And so I don't like it when other Republicans, you know, talk a big game. And then when push comes to shove, you know, we'll tell, you know, maybe Tucker Carlson what he wants to hear when Tucker still had his show. But when their donors pat them on the back, say, well, you know, I didn't really mean what I said about Ukraine. We just need people who have a spine. And I think we've lacked that for a very long time. And I appreciate that about people like you or Tucker or otherwise in the world you're in, even though the media has had its own backlash against you. You guys continue to speak. In the political world, that doesn't exist, actually. Everybody else just lines up like pawns, like supplicating lap dogs when the moment calls and the super PAC class says you've gone too far. And I'm not, I'm not dependent on that super PAC class. I'm not a super PAC puppet. I'm a patriot who speaks the truth. And that's the choice we actually face. And what you represent or what Tucker Carlson represents, which is essential, or even Jordan Peterson represents in the world of media, that is vital. That does not exist even in the Republican Party today, let alone in the political establishment. And that is what gives me my sense of duty to see this through.